And we are live, so take it away, Melanie. Thank you so much, Sophia. And good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Melanie Jacobs, a librarian at the Pratt Light Street Branch. A reminder that all Pratt locations are open to the public at 50% capacity, safety protocols in place, and with expanded hours of operation. Pick up the latest compass at your local library or go to prattlibrary.org to discover information about Pratt's upcoming author events, Ask a Master Gardener, Social Worker in the Library, Pratt Test Kitchen, and Artist in Residence programs. Let's begin this evening's event. Welcome to What Did You Do During the Pandemic? A new interactive lecture series exploring the ways people entertained themselves, learned, and grew during the isolation of the past year. This is an interactive program so please share your questions and comments. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. There will be a Q&A at the end of the program. Tonight's featured speaker is Phil Jacoby, who's going to be speaking about his love of kayaking and his experiences as a volunteer with Team River Runner, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide veterans and their families an opportunity to find health, healing, and community purpose through paddle sports. Welcome and take it away, Phil. Thank you, Melanie. Hi, everybody out there in uh, Cyberland. My name is Phil Jacoby. Um, I've known the librarian, Melanie Jacobs, for years. It's my local Pratt branch. You should take the kids down there, check out all kinds of wild books there. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing. The library is an incredible resource. And I'm, I'm honored to be asked about what I did during the pandemic. It, you know, it sounds a little bit like a school report. You know, it's the school year is starting again. And the teacher goes, oh, tell us what you did over summer vacation. So when she first asked, I was like, wow. And then I thought about it. It's like, you know, I, I really did a lot. COVID was a massively huge change. Um, Sophia, would you please uh, put up the first slide? Okay, what I did during COVID. This is my report, y'all. Next slide, please. Before COVID, I was playing live music, kayaking with buddies, and helping lead a Boy Scout troop. So I'm a musician. I uh, repair guitars in my professional life. Um, I play music whenever I can. I love to play music. The picture there, the band shot, is uh, me playing with Martin Taylor, Martin's Funking Humans. At Moms, that was the last gig before the world shut down for us. It was February 28th, 2020, and it was a belated Mardi Gras gig, and we just had a great time. You know, music was a huge part of my life, and I love playing live, and I go to a lot of jam sessions, and, you know, that just, that wasn't going to happen once COVID hit, as you all well know. The picture of the three kayakers there are myself and two friends of mine. Uh, Cindy is on one side of me in the white kayak, and in the red is Jimmy Cummings, um, Jimmy is a paratrooper veteran who was with us in this area for a while, and now he took a job down at Fort Rucker. Great paddler. I met him before all this stuff went down. The bottom picture is my Boy Scout Troop 454 departing for Sea Base High Adventure in the summer of 2019. It's a very active and busy troop. I'm an assistant scoutmaster. My job is to facilitate program, and we just keep it hopping. Next slide, please. So the outdoors and rivers run in my family. The black and white picture you see there with the canoe going vertical, that is my Uncle Doug, and he's doing what's called an ender in a rapid where he buried the bow on that thing on purpose. Uh, Doug is who I learned a lot about paddling from beginning at a very early age. In the 70s, we did a lot of canoeing, canoe camping, a lot of whitewater canoeing. And at that time, modern kayaking as we know it was sort of dawning. I grew up in Silver Spring down in Montgomery County, very close to the Potomac River. Potomac River is my home river. Paddled a lot, know it like the back of my hand. The next picture is me carrying a canoe up off the CNO Canal. There's a lot of access to the Potomac River off the CNO. And we sometimes use the flat water of the CNO to paddle back to our put in so you don't even have to set shuttle. Those canoes can be kind of heavy, 
but I, I learned to carry them early because, you know, humping the gear is half the fun. It's the second half of our CrossFit workout. So when I was a teenager, we had something called the Thursday Club, where we would meet at a spot on the Potomac every Thursday as soon as school let out for me. And my uncle and my dad and our good friend Joe Mornini would get out of work early. We would all meet down there and we would paddle until dusk. It was community. It was fellowship. It was great exercise. It was learning new techniques. It was being out in nature. All wonderful things. And that became what would later on help start Team River Runner. Next slide, please. So my time as a scout leader has really helped prepare me for what we call servant leadership. Servant leadership is when we have a goal that we want to achieve. So someone has to lead a group to do it. We have to organize. And servant leadership is the leader is looking out for his people, trying to fulfill the goal, but also making sure his crew is taken care of. Scouting has really helped teach me and reinforce that, you know, with my musical background, I've never had a corporate job. I've never served in the military. I've never had any sort of team building experience on that lines or guidance in that world. When I became a, a Boy Scout leader for my son's troop, I began taking their training and again, facilitating program. That's what I do. I go out, I get wet, I get dirty and we have a whole lot of fun. We learn skills while we're out there. So what you see there is various patches I've collected. I, um, I have, done the ordeal for the Order of the Arrow. There's a few merit badge booklets there. And there's one in particular that was really touching for me, Disabilities Awareness. So my son's first year at Boy Scout Summer Camp at Broad Creek Scout Reservation, which is off the Susquehanna up in the northern part of the state. That's the Baltimore Area Council's home camp. The week at camp, we had a youth chaplain who was probably in his early 20s, it's a young man named Bobby. And Bobby had cerebral palsy and was in a motorized wheelchair. And, you know, one night after he said grace at dinner at this camp, we all ate dinner together rather than cooking our sites. He announced, hey, I'm going to offer disability awareness merit badge course, you know, in the main meeting hall after dinner, if you guys want to meet. So I was intrigued. A lot of the people were intrigued. So we stopped by there. And at the same time in camp, there was a, a special needs scout troop. And, you know, these are older guys that never age out of scouting. Some have Down syndrome, some have TBIs, some have different abilities in a way that uh, they don't age out at the traditional age of 18. They're allowed to stay in as long as they want, keep chipping away towards, you know, make an eagle rank, basically program. And the, the woman that runs our local troop is just amazing. So these guys were there, too. And what was really neat about it is we got to hear their thoughts about how they felt about accessibility in the world, what it means to be living with a disability or a different ability. You know, we don't say disabled people. We say people with disabilities. You know, they're not labeled by what they can't do. We're thinking more about how we can do things, how we can create accessibility, how we can adapt. And it was a really eye-opening program for me. I'd always been aware of some things like that, but it really just sunk at home. It was probably one of the most powerful seminars I've ever taken. It really left a mark on me like that. Some other things in the picture, there's a smartphone dry box there. That's how I got all my river pictures. There's a throw rope. We always carry a rope for safety. And there's my hat from Wood Badge. Wood Badge is like an executive leadership course offered by Boy Scouts of America for training leaders. So we can go out there and really be ready to do the job. I can't say enough about that training. It's really been invaluable to me and it really helped prepare me to volunteer with Team River Runner, to communicate with different groups of people, um, to have a servant leadership style, to be comfortable, more comfortable in the outdoors than I already was and being able to share it with folks. You, know, you really know a topic well when you can present it to someone else because you have to take all those disparate thoughts and make them concise, unlike my rambling presentation here to deliver it to somebody else. So, you know, hopefully that they can understand the information and use it. And scouts really help prepare me for that. Next slide, please. All right. Joe Mornini is executive director and one of the two founders of Team River Runner. I've known Joe since I was a kid, since I was about 10 years old. He was my Uncle Doug's best friend. And when I decided to come back to paddling in 2016 after a long hiatus, Joe loaned me some gear right away. You know, there, it can be a little bit of a barrier to entry, borrowing gear, buying gear. 
especially during a pandemic when everything is so expensive. But I called Joe up and said, hey, man, I really want to get back on the river. And he said, sure, I'll, I'll swing by and drop off some, some gear. And so I was able to borrow some personal gear and I started getting back out. And how I wound up getting back out was I just happened to be on Facebook and I stumbled across a post from Baltimore Canoe and Kayak Club. You know, they were offering their beginner series. And I thought, wow, man, I haven't been on the river in 27 years. I'm going to be really rusty. So I borrowed some gear from Joe and also from my cousin, Jeremy, who had uh, my Uncle Doug's old gear. Unfortunately, my Uncle Doug has passed away, but his legacy lives on through us with all the fun things we do on the river and sharing program. So I was able to borrow the gear and I showed up at the beginner session. It's a flat water session out of Daniel's Dam and felt good. You know, felt like I was home again. The, the boat I loaned was period correct for when I, I ceased paddling in, in the early 90s. And it just, it really fit. It felt good. I was like, you know, I'm in the right place. And so while I was horsed around practicing some bracing maneuvers, I flipped. And somehow I managed to roll right back up. I still had my, my Eskimo roll, they used to call it. After 27 years, I still was able to roll a kayak. It was serendipitous. And I, I was like, I'm home. And so I went through their beginner's program pretty quickly um, since I wasn't a raw beginner. But I began to see how they shared program with new people that were interested and how they looked out for each other on the river in terms of safety. You know, any type of water sport has an inherent element of danger to it. So we all look out for each other. Some people describe kayaking as an individual sport that we do together, and it really is. So you form very strong bonds on the river, looking after people, looking out for each other, traveling in teams. We often call it a crew. You'll have a few buddies you're super tight with, and they become your crew. You know, they're the folks that, you know, oh, man, it's going to rain like crazy. Ellicott City is going to be close to flooding. The Patapsco goes running. Let's go run it, man. Let's hit it. And you know, your buddies are like, yeah, they're up. You know, these are the guys you're going surfing with. So some great pictures of Joe here. The bottom one he's uh, pointing at looks like a turkey buzzard there on the river. We see a lot of wildlife on the river. It's gorgeous. The upper shot, uh, he's strapping boats on top of a Team River Runner van somewhere out west. And then the, the bottom corner shot where he's laughing, he's in the water with Lonnie Bedwell, who is a blind veteran who is an amazing kayaker. Lonnie has run the Grand Canyon like four or five times. He was a National Geographic Adventure of the Year in 2015. And I believe he has some type of relationship with Jackson Kayaks, which is uh, one of the major brands in our sport. Eric Jackson actually was a U.S. Olympic team member and did a lot of training on the Potomac back in the uh, early 90s. So lots of roots there, lots of roots there. And it was just, everything was just tying together for me. Next slide, please. So I am not a veteran, but I do have family that served. Uh, here's a picture of my grandfather's uh, headstone in Arlington Cemetery. He was career army and he finished his career at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Um, there's my son and I together visiting around one Veterans Day years ago. We left a penny and I think Philip wanted to leave one of his service pins. The next picture is uh, my father-in-law, Eugene Ebel, who's a great man. He's buried in Crownsville Veterans Cemetery. Our scout troop gets together there every Memorial Day to put out flags and have a ceremony. It's, it's very touching. It's important to remember those folks that have done so much for us, you know, gratitude is the attitude. So, you know, I love veterans. I love everybody, but I love veterans. Thank you, everybody. Next slide, please. Okay. So team river runners mission values and the four pillars. First and foremost is lifestyle. Kayaking is a lifestyle, just like going out, you know, the Thursday club, you know, we get together and we go out. Um, we're outside. We're using our whole bodies. We're breathing fresh air. We're moving. We're burning calories. You know, we're using muscle. Uh, we enjoy doing these things. We're not sitting on a bar stool. We're not engaged in something unhealthy. Um, we're just out there in Mother Nature, and it's just a beautiful thing. It's inclusive. Team River Run originally started with the primary focus of uh, helping these guys develop into whitewater paddlers. Whitewater is rapids, aerated water because the water is flowing over uh, features, obstacles, which creates some really interesting things on the rivers that we get to run through and play in and sometimes get stuck and get a beating. But 
it's just a lot of fun. So by inclusive, we mean all paddle sports, flat water paddling, wreck boats, stand up paddle boarding is a big one, inflatables like rafting, shredders, duckies. You know, in a raft, you can get more people that um, that don't have quite as high a river skill level out so that they can enjoy the same things that we're enjoying. One of the purposes is to help develop leadership. As Team River Runner began expanding, they were like, wow, you know, we need to, to teach people how to lead these chapters. And when you empower somebody to be a leader, to have that chance at servant leadership, you know, they really grow a lot. Uh, just like I grew with scouting, just like our Boy Scouts grow as they they uh, cycle through leadership and attain ranks. You know, it their shoulders broaden. They're able to see more and do more and understand how all the pieces work together. It's a very unique thing. And leadership is just, it's amazing. You know, Boy Scout is uh, youth leadership development. Team River Runner, we're developing leadership within the chapters on the river, working with each other. Generosity. So they collaborate with the adaptive sport industry, which is actually a big and growing industry, which is great to see. You know, it's it's not disabilities, it's different abilities. And you know, there's room for everybody. Let's get out and do stuff. But one of the other really cool things about generosity is the program is free to participants. And this includes loaning the gear. Outdoor programs can be a, a little bit prohibitive. If you had to buy all the gear from scratch, you wouldn't know what to get. You wouldn't be able to beta test things. Team River Runner has the gear. Um, the gear comes from donations, from sponsorships. You know, we're very uh, adaptive with the gear. We repair gear. I've repaired a lot of boats, uh, helped outfit trailers. You know, we're always doing something to squeak everything we can out of the gear. You know, none of us are paid. We're all volunteers, but we, we squeeze that gear for everything it's got because we're happy to share it. We have gear. We create access. That's a wonderful thing. And Joe Mornini always says butts in boats. And this is a big deal. It's just get people out in boats. You know, the magic will happen if we're out there. People will grow. People will learn new things. They'll develop confidence. You'll see things that you could never see otherwise. You get the bond of a crew, that purpose, community, belonging, fellowship, all wonderful stuff. Next slide, please. Adaptive paddling. So this is a big deal and it's still a new and developing field. Um, I had a book around here somewhere. Looks like I misplaced it. So what adaptive paddling is, is we're trying to fit people to boats so that they can maneuver. You know, paddling is an active sport. You're actually using pretty much everything you put in the boat, your core, how you uh, use your, your knees and your hips in the boat. It's not just arms and shoulders. You know, we often say when we're teaching that men make terrible students because we try to over muscle it and do it all with our upper body. You can't do that. You know, it's it's a full body. You have to learn about torso rotation, staying safe in what we call the box so you don't expose your shoulders for dislocation, um, how to really put power in things, how to brace yourself in the boat so that all your movement translates to the boat because you're telling the boat where you want to go. So this picture sequence here is a Team River Runner volunteer named Gene. Jean is a double amputee. She's very independent. She drives. Um, she's a great paddler. She comes out for some of these adaptive events. And this here is the boat dock at Riley's Lock on the Potomac. It's a Lock 24. It's next to Caliva's River School. And it's a very popular training area. It's right on Seneca Creek. <clears throat> now, Seneca Creek is, is a small flatwater creek. And it's a great place to get in the boat for the first time. And what this adaptive dock does is it helps us get people into the boat. So if you see the first picture in the upper left, Jean is sitting on what's called a transfer bench. And she's scooting herself over to place herself to enter down into the cockpit. The person standing behind the boat is Lisa Weed. Lisa is the Walter Reed chapter coordinator. Just an amazing, awesome person. Just patient, giving, encouraging even the knucklehead volunteers like me. And you see there, Jean still has her prosthetics on. When they're in the boat, they take the prosthetics off. You never take anything on the river you want to lose. And you would think, wow, would that, would that make it harder to do certain things? Actually, no, you're, you're freer without those things. In, in the boat, you're, the boat is becoming part of you. The boat becomes an extension of your body. So she's going to hand the legs off to somebody for safekeeping while she's out on the river. So the ramp has rollers on it. So once you're in the boat, 
You can pull yourself forward on the rails and the rollers will help guide you in. And there you see she's entering the water. This makes it very easy for people that don't have complete use of their lower limbs to get in and out of the water too. It's just an amazing thing. This was done as a partnership with uh, Montgomery County and the river community. It took a while to lobby to have it done, but it's done. It gets regular use. It's a tremendous asset. You know, we're creating accessibility here and that's always a wonderful thing. Next slide, please. All right, adaptive paddling events. There's been a few of them locally here, hosted by the Friends of Patapsco Valley State Park. They are a uh, nonprofit group that helps take care of the park and helps promote the park. There's trails there, um, there's disc golf, you know, there's all kinds of picnic spots. The park is beautiful and the Patapsco River obviously runs through part of the park. So that area there is Daniel's Dam, which is a flat water area, which is another great training area. That's where I, I did the uh, first beginner class for Baltimore Canoe and Kayak. And here you see people out on the water. If you look carefully at the kayak to the right, it has outriggers on it. And this helps keep the boat more stable. You know, not everybody wants to be in a tippy boat or is ready to handle that. And that's okay. You know, it's, we just want to get them out on the water. Anything we can do to get them out on the water is wonderful. Picture on the top right is Joe Mornini in a blue shirt. And he's discussing some of the adaptations. And if, if you look at that kayak there, there's a center pillar in it that the paddle's mounted on. This is for people that don't have a lot of upper body strength so that they can keep the paddle up and they can dip it, um, they can turn. There's actually devices that can help attach hands that, that you know struggle to grip the shaft very well. It's just amazing how the gear has come. The gear is, a lot of it is designed by a group called um, Creating Ability. And the gear is always changing and it's super, super innovative. The bottom right picture there, you see Joe's talking to the group. You know, every time we have an adaptive event, we review how we're using gear and, and how we do things. And you can see in that picture, there's a portable transfer bench, which is very important. And the big gray tires, that's called the chariot. So what happens is we help somebody get in the boat, safe place on land, like here's the parking lot. And then we have a couple of people help take the boat down to the water with the chariot and the chariot can actually go in the water. So we get the boat completely in the water before we disconnect the chariot. And then, you know, we have a couple safety boaters as companions and, you know, we're off to the races. It's a wonderful thing. So far, there's been four adaptive paddling events at Daniel's Dam and all four of them occurred during COVID. And it's really interesting, you know, Team River Runners is always looking for ways to reach out. And if chapters at capacity for veterans and veterans family, they will also help other differently abled people be able to access the water and the outdoors. So we have lots of folks that come out that we share a program with to help them enjoy the same stuff that we're all enjoying. And, you know, it adds value. It's a value added thing. Everybody digs it. The center picture there, I'm standing next to a friend of mine from college, uh, Carol Tyson. We both went to Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff. She moved to DC, back to this area before I did, and she was bicycle commuting and she was hit by a Metro bus. So uh, Carol is an amputee and she, these days she advocates for rights for the disabled and differently abled. And I was able to get her to come out to one of our paddling events. She has a, a boat club membership down in DC and paddles the larger part of the Potomac down there a lot for exercise. And she was all about it. She got in the boat and, you know, tore it up. It, it was great to see her. It was great to share a program with her. Patapsco Valley State Park reached out for volunteers, Baltimore Canoe and Kayak, which I'm also a member of. You know, we, we got a lot of uh, folks out there to help facilitate, to learn about adaptive paddling so we can assist, to help be safety boaters. You know, Team River Runner provided the gear. It was just an amazing day. Um, I go to every single one of these I can. I, I swear I get more out of volunteering at these events than I think the other participants get. It feels really good to help people have new experiences, to have good experiences, to learn, to grow, um, to feel like they belong. Next slide, please. All right, this is the out of sight clinic. Once upon a time, there was some blind veterans, veterans that are visually impaired that wanted to participate. And, you know, people were like, no way. How, how are we going to do that? And Joe was like, we're going to find a way. And so they found a way and they created the, the out of sight group out of sight clinics. 
The picture on the top right is Lonnie Bedwell. Lonnie Bedwell is a guy I was telling you about earlier who's paddled the Grand Canyon several times. Lonnie is a retired uh, Navy Petty officer, and he lost his sight in a hunting accident. But he still maintains amazing independence. Um, he is a motivational speaker. He is an author. Um, he has a wonderful blog. He's just always motivating people to keep going, keep moving forward. He has a fantastic attitude, and that guy is a demon on the water. I mean, he looks like he was born in that boat. He is a natural. If you look at the bottom center picture, you can see as we're loading the van, he's standing there with a stick. And, you know, if you've watched a person with a visual impairment walking using a using a, a cane, you know, they're always checking for stuff. Lonnie knows where he is in the water. It's just truly amazing. And the guy is so locked into his boat. When a paddler is really locked into their boat, it's it's graceful. Um, it's powerful, but it looks effortless and just so clean. I mean, I want to be that clean. I'm always working on skills. When we're working on skills, we call the progression. Lonnie, you know, he's way far in his progression. He looks fantastic. So this is some other pictures from that day. In the bottom right is a woman in an inflatable kayak, what we call a ducky. She is an Army veteran who served in Iraq. Her name is Raquel. And Raquel is visually impaired, but she's also pretty much deaf in her left ear. This was my, my paddling companion for the day. Um, we had a wild day. She'd never really been in a boat before. In this type of situation, uh, we were going to paddle some whitewater. As you can see the picture on the left, that is Yellow Falls, which is on the run from Anglers to Lock Town in the Potomac. I'd say it's a class two rapid, but you know, you can get pretty banged up. You know, there's rocks in the river and all kinds of fun stuff. And so it was, you know, my task was to share this ride with her and help guide her down. And how you guide a visually impaired paddler is you guys choose the catchphrase and you'll be out front paddling where you want to be and you'll use that catchphrase. Some people say here or some people say on me and uh, the visually impaired folks will follow you by sound. Well, this was really tricky with, with Raquel because I had to make sure I was in a place where she could hear me. And also the ducky, they tend to spin a lot. They don't really have a keel or anything, but she worked so hard and she was such a good sport and she had an absolute blast. It was an amazing day. It was a lot of work, but it was an amazing day. And I was really happy to help provide access for that. And, you know, I got to learn a lot about, you know, working with visually impaired folks. It was just a wonderful thing. The center picture there of the boats lined up against the shore, the person in the foreground is Scott Russell. He's the chapter coordinator for Fort Belvoir chapter. And behind him is Lisa Weed, the chapter coordinator for the Walter Reed chapter. Now I want to backtrack a little bit. How Team River Runner started, it started in 2004. Basically, sort of similar to a Thursday club type thing. You know, Joe and uh, Mike McCormick, a few other paddlers around saying, you know, we'd, we'd really like to do something to help some of these guys. You know, a lot of wounded veterans coming from, you know, the war on terror, Iraq and Afghanistan, into Walter Reed. And, you know, these, these folks, they really benefit from program, from lifting spirits, from access, some type of rehab a sense of belonging, exercise, fresh air, you name it. It just, it works for everybody. So it works for them too. And so they were pondering how they would be able to gain access. Well, one of the persons that happened to be at, at Anglers was a doctor at Walter Reed that Joe had given some kayak lessons to. And somehow it was the right conversation with the right people. And uh, this doctor says to Joe, I'll give you a number to call to see if you can get access to help these guys to start working in the pool. And so luckily that person was the right person because it's very hard to get, you know, Walter Reed to do things, to get a large entity to do something like that. It's you starting from scratch. You, you got a, a lot to figure out. So pretty soon they started offering program at the pool at Walter Reed, working with, with veterans that wanted to try this. And oftentimes we work in the pool first to, to work on skills in a, a non-flowing river environment. Um, it's a little bit easier to have control and to coach and to get people acclimated. And also at that time, you know, that they're learning about adaptive paddling, how to do this stuff. And so it started there. Well, other veterans that were there for other reasons, you know, cancer, traumatic brain injury, um, PTSD, they saw these guys working out in the pool, you know, folks that were rehabbing for other things. 
And they're like, hey, we'd like to participate too. So right off the bat, the program started growing. And at this time, I believe Team River Runner is in over 30 states. I think there's close to 60 chapters. You know, some are whitewater, some are flat water, some, you know, push rubber, what we call inflatables, pushing a raft. It's just an amazing thing. And how I wound up with Fort Belvoir was when COVID hit, um, the world really changed for all of us. But for me, it's like gigging ended. And I had been working really hard with this band I was in and just really had all my hopes on that. And I didn't know what to do with myself. I was beside myself. You know, I couldn't see my son who lives with his mom, who also paddles with me and paddles with Team River Runner. You know, we weren't sure what was safe to do. And somewhere in that, I uh, received an email from Scott Russell, who had started the beginners program at, at uh, BC Casey. I knew him from there. And he's like, hey, you know, we're looking out for uh, some folks to, to come help with the Fort Belvoir chapter. And the Fort Belvoir chapter around here is known as the Whitewater chapter. The bad boys of Belvoir is what Lisa Weed calls us. You know, we like to go run some fun stuff, um, push limits, you know, when the water's high, we're out there and it's a great team. Fort Belvoir chapter, you know, it's, it's some retired military. It's some active military. You know, a lot of guys from the Army, a lot of guys from the Navy. Uh, we had one paddler uh, from Canada who was Canadian Army Exchange for a while. And they come down here for three years, kind of a mutual exchange program. He got the bug down here with us. Um, amazing paddler. He's up in Canada now. So I have a friend now if I want to go up and hit the Ottawa River, which is a great training river. So the connections just started being made and you know, out of sight clinic is one of those places where we cross again and we're helping provide program. Next slide, please. All right. Being resourceful. Like I said, you know, we have to fundraise, which is always a tricky thing. Um, but we do a lot with the dollar we get. And uh, what you see here is this was a party to outfit a trailer we have someone we call the boat whisperer named John Sue. John Sue is a longtime Team River Runner volunteer. And what John does is he hustles up boats, used boats, cracked boats, any way he can get a deal on gear to provide for use in the program. So part of what he's done is some boats they actually sell and they use this to facilitate buying trailers. Now, why do you need a trailer? You need a trailer so you can take the gear down to the river. That's how we, we get this going on. You know, one of these trailers can take anywhere from, you know, 10 to 14 kayaks. Inside, we have hangers for the PFDs. That's personal flotation device. I've got one hanging behind me. Helmets, paddles, spray skirts, you know, white water boats. You have a spray skirt in to keep the water out. That's how we're able to facilitate rolling and all that other kind of fun stuff. On this picture here, you see this is a volunteer day in the summer. Again, somebody reached out and said, hey, we need a hand outfitting the trailer. So... I'm handy and I like doing those things. So I said, sure, I'll be more than happy to come out and help rig a trailer. We sort of had to think outside the box. So we got some, some framing material and some super strut, which is a, an industrial uh, hanger that's used to hang like HVAC systems and heavy electric systems in like commercial buildings, industrial buildings. And we use that to support the kayaks and make it movable. The picture all the way on the left, you see my son is standing in front of one of the big kayak storage places. All those boats are used. They're all donated. They live long lives with us. We take great care of them. And when they die, when they're cracked or broken, John Sue cuts them up to make hand paddles. This is a set of hand paddles. Um, don't know if you guys can see, I'll do show and tell in a minute. Instead of using a, a regular paddle with a shaft. So we give the boats new life. You know, we use everything as much as we can uh, before it winds up going on to something else. Incidentally, the boats are made out of HDPE, high density plastic. It's the same stuff milk cartons are made out of. It's a slightly different formulation. And it it was a revolution in kayaking in the late 70s because before that it was fiberglass. And, you know, boats damaged easily. They could be kind of heavy. So plastic allowed us to get even more radical with the boats and push it and have them last longer. Just a ton of fun. You can break a plastic boat, but it's hard to do and it's a lot of fun doing it. Next slide, please. First day in a kayak. So the picture on the right is Ken. Ken is a veteran that came down for his first day. Um, he found the program through the Veterans Administration, I believe in DC. 
You can see Ken is a, is a double amputee. Ken was a Navy corpsman stationed with a Marine unit. That's, that's all I know. That's, that's all I would ask about. It's not my job to go into things. People talk if they want to talk. I'm here to provide program and fellowship. And Ken loved it. He had a great day on the water. You see the lower center picture. We're at the, uh, the adaptive dock again at Riley's Lock. See, everybody's wearing masks. VA is pretty strict on masks, even outside, which is good. Ken is sitting on the transfer bench as we're hustling his boat onto the rollers there. Man in the flannel behind us is Joe. Joe Mornini is over there checking on us, making sure everybody's having a good time. Facilitating program. Top shot is Ken is in Seneca Creek, and we're beginning to work on strokes. He's smiling. Had a great time. The shot on the left side. We're out on the Potomac. Potomac is very wide there. It was a gorgeous, gorgeous sunny day. And this is all in the month of October. Everything I'm showing you pictures of pretty much happened in the month of October. Shows you how vibrant the program is, all the stuff we're doing. I took the picture on the left. You can see the bow of my kayak there. Same kayak that's behind me, the red uh, dagger rewind. And we're, you know, Ken paddled all the way across the river, you know, and he was up for it, paddled all the way back. It was a great day. You know, he felt it afterwards, but it's good. You know, he goes to a gym and he works out, but, but this, you know, instead of dealing with resistance or pushing weights around or something, you, you're out, you're out doing something. You're out in nature. You're out with people with similar interests and experiences. You know, you're sharing something. It's, it, it can be a lot more fun than, you know, just rehabbing in a gym. And it's always amazing when you get these guys out on their first day to see the light come on for them, to know that you're sharing something really cool and that they're having a wonderful experience out of it. And this is, this is one of the main reasons why, why I do this. And same thing with, with scouting, you know, helping people and, and see them appreciate it, you know, see things enriched for them, you know, broadening, broadening experiences and horizons. It's just really an amazing, wonderful feeling for me. And, you know, some people would say, Oh, wow. You know, th these folks have disabilities, you know, I don't, you know, I, I should be, I should be grateful I'm not in that position. It's not like that. You know, it's not inspiration porn. It's just sharing with other people and giving them access to stuff they wouldn't have access to before. And there are so many people that that don't have obvious disabilities, that don't have access to this stuff. So here we are creating the, the ability to share the outdoors, share the water, share community, appreciate the environment. It's just a beautiful thing. So first day is always fun. I've had a few of those and they're great. Although I have to tell you, First day, I really watch these guys like a hawk because the traditional beginners program, we start with what's called a wet exit. Uh, we don't do that with the amputees. We, uh, we try to approach that stuff a little bit slower. Everybody in a kayak eventually is going to do what we call swim. That's when something happens and you dump out of the boat. And saying on the river is we're all between swims. And it's true. I've swam. You know, I haven't swum much lately, but I've swum. And I've, some of it's been big stuff, too. Um, the river will get your attention. That's for sure. Mother nature always wins. So I watch these guys like a hawk. Um, just always want to make sure they're having a safe experience, a good experience. Next slide, please. All right. The team river run biathlon. So the biathlon is one mile of paddling and then three miles of running, walking, or hand cycling. It's timed. It is a charity event. The people are sponsored. They accept donations. And this all goes into running program, facilitating access. This was down at the Washington Canoe Club, which is by the Key Bridge on the lower part of the Potomac. This was on October 2nd. It's the 17th annual biathlon. They didn't have one um, in 2020, obviously, because COVID just really disrupted things. And COVID was very hard for everybody, but especially folks like TRR, because, you know, the population we serve and provide program to, they really benefit from this program. They, they need to get out and we provide access for them to get out. And COVID, it was hard to get people out, you know, not only were there safety concerns about how to get people to the river and, you know, how safe is it from a, a COVID protocol standpoint, but people were missing the program. As you know, I'm sure some of you guys felt it too. Just a lot of, a lot of feelings of anxiety around being, being cooped up, you know, not being able to do things that you want to do, not being able to have access to community. So these pictures, top right is a picture of me with Lonnie Bedwell. I've always wanted to take a picture about with Lonnie. Um, I find him to be very inspiring. I just, 
I haven't kayaked the Grand Canyon yet, and I would love to. Uh, there's some serious big water there. It's an amazing river. It's a bucket list item for me. Lonnie's paddled it five times. I mean, he styles it. He has a website, LonnieBedwell.com. There's some video on there of him charging through Lava Falls on the Grand Canyon, which is a huge, huge rapid. It's just inspiring. And he just takes charge, always has a sunny disposition, just a fantastic guy and a hell of a paddler. The two other pictures you see, um, this is my second time guiding a visually impaired paddler. That is Sharon. Sharon is an Army medic, veteran. She now runs a program that helps people with uh, rehab and getting their lives back on track down in Arkansas. This was her first biathlon and some of her first experiences in the boat. Sharon had an awesome attitude, a hilarious sense of humor. We were cracking up the entire time. And I, I led her on her, her biathlon water stint. She did great. And she has amazing ears. She was on me like white on rice. We had a fantastic time. The picture on the left, we're pulling up to the dock at conclusion, but she just tore it up. She had a great time. And, you know, I have a new friend now. And that was a wonderful experience. Come back, Sharon. We need you. Next slide, please. Information. Okay. Some of the organizations I talked about, these are web addresses for them. If you're interested in the program or you're interested in getting out, you can uh, go on Team River Runner site. The quickest way to get information is info at, at teamriverrunner.org. And they'll tell you who your local chapter is. The local chapter will talk to you about what opportunities are available. Uh, below that is baltimorecanoeclub.org. This is BC Casey, local to the Baltimore area. Um, just a wonderful group of people. We're all sharing our love of the river and getting out there. Super, super, super supportive. They run a great beginner series. Kaliva is below that. Kaliva is a very well-known river school. Their program is amazing. I've taken classes from Kaliva. Uh, the last one, big one I took, well, I actually took my ACA instructor certification course through them. The guy that leads that program, Stephen Cohn, is an amazing paddler, fantastic instructor, really helped me think of other ways to deliver information and see skills in a different way and tighten up my skills as well. I, I got so much from it. My progression was increased by that. Um, incidentally, Team River Runner sponsored me to take the ACA certification. It's, it's a program that has some cost. Um, I don't have tons of disposable income, you know, just doing the music thing. But I was really humbled to be asked. They said, hey, you're, you're out volunteering all the time. You're an asset to our chapter, both chapters, because I volunteer a lot with Walter Reed now. Lisa Reed's got me roped in, and I love working with those guys too. <clears throat> and they said, we want, you to, we want you to get certified. You know, that'll take you to the next level, um, makes you safe for insurance purposes and all that stuff. I just learned so much. I'm still digesting it, and I can't wait to go back and get more training. I also took their cheat training. The cheat is a river out of uh, Parsons and Albright, West Virginia. It's sort of, you know, where Maryland ends, it's not far from there. It's an amazing river that runs through a uh, canyon, part of it, Cheat Canyon. And so cheat training was longboat attaining. Attaining is paddling up river. And that's what a lot of us do for workouts, especially in the winter. You can race doing attaining. Um, it teaches stroke efficiency. It is a complete full body workout. It can be beautifully exhausting. I sleep fantastic after being on the river anyway, but after attaining, I really sleep well. So that training was amazing. And during the winter, there was a veteran I paddled with out of Fort Belvoir named Scott Woosley, Navy veteran. And I got Scott out a lot. I was taking him down to anglers. You know, we were working on surfing. You know, we were working on combat roles. That's where you're rolling in current. You know, something happens, you're playing, you get flipped, you got to get back up. Self-rescue. That's a large part of this is self-rescue. Self-rescue is a life skill, whether you're learning the river version or a version in anything you're into in life. We're, you got to take care of number one. Don't be the next victim. Self-rescue. So we worked on that a ton. And Scott really made a lot of strides. You know, he was my paddle buddy during the winter and we went out constantly. We were out when the, you know, the water temp was 35 degrees. We were out that cold. So I talked Scott into taking cheat training with me. Um, it was a little bit of a reach for him. But he rose to the occasion and that just advanced his progression even more. You know, hard work pays off. And now, you know, Scott is just a solid boater and we have a lot of fun on these rivers. And that was, again, a program put on by Kaleva. One of the people associated with Kaleva is uh, Tom McEwen. Tom was one of the original 
guys to paddle Great Falls, one of sort of the sort of the grandfathers of the whitewater world in the DC community. And DC area for folks that may not be familiar, it's what Aspen, Colorado is for skiing is what the DC area is for whitewater kayaking. We just have so much available here. It's local. You can blow out of school or out of work for something like the Thursday club and be down there and get a few laps in, you know, before the day's over. It, it's part of the lifestyle, getting out there and doing it. You know, if you live at the beach, you're a surfer, you live on the river, you're going to kayak. It's just an amazing, wonderful thing. And, you know, Kaliva helps with a lot of training for that. And, and folks like Tom McEwen blaze the way. Below that is the uh, American Canoe Association. What they do is they promote river access, education, training, and safety. That's who I hold my instructor certification through. They also uh, have certifications in other forms of river safety. And one of the big ones, at least for me, is swift water rescue. That's a, a fairly new field as water sports developed. Rescue became a really big thing, you know, learning how to be safe out there and how to deal with situations as they arise. And I found it to be very instructive. Since 2017, I've taken eight separate swift water rescue classes. I'm probably going to get my certification to teach. It's, it's a topic I'm also very passionate about, you know, keeping it safe out there. I've, I've seen some wild stuff, some fun stuff, and we want to make sure we can all laugh about it at the end. The bottom group is American Whitewater, and AW collects a lot of river data. If you want to know about a river section, you know, what the classifications are, what to look out for, where the put-ins and takeouts are, that's where you go. You, know, you can also look at like uh, U.S. Geological Survey water gauges and stuff, but American Whitewater is going to give you beta you really can't get anywhere else. It's just an incredibly, incredibly deep collection of information. And so I'm a member of American Whitewater. I'm also a member of the ACA and Team River Runner and Baltimore Canoe Club. Also Mason Dixon Canoe Club, which is a kayaking group based out of Harper's Ferry. The Shenandoah is their home river. We go out there and run that a lot. That's only an hour's drive for me from Baltimore. Um, there's a few other groups out there. Every local area has something around here. And it's just one of Conewago Canoe and Kayak. Some of my buddies up from uh, Pennsylvania, you know, running the Cadoras and York. Muddy Creek feeding into the Susquehanna, uh, Holtwood Play Park, which is below the Susquehanna Dam. It's just more great access, just wonderful people, always willing to share, you know, wonderful fellowship. Next slide, please. All right. I have to say thank you to people because, you know, I've had a lot of help on my journey. And uh, first and foremost is Joe Mornini. Like I said, he's a dear family friend, and he helped me get back out on the water, which is part of my path to, to healing and recovery dealing with some life challenges and he's always there as a resource. He's always encouraging. And, you know, it's, it's full circle for me knowing Joe as a, as a child and then knowing him now as an adult and being part of this wonderful thing he's doing. Scott Russell is a Fort Belvoir chapter coordinator. Scott's the one that invited me to really volunteer with TR. I said, Hey man, we could use you. We need some help. You know, Scott really opened some doors for me and made me a valued part of the team and asset. Lisa Weed, chapter coordinator for Walter Reed, you know, she takes, she takes these veterans um, and meets them wherever they need to be. And is just one of the kindest, supportive, compassionate people. Um, wonderful to do program with uh, super calm, always finds a way, always positive, just a can do attitude. Then I need to say thanks to Ashley McEwen and Steve McCone. They're Kaliva instructors. Ashley instructed the cheat training. I had Steve-O for ACA training and also some other specialty classes, you know, getting stuck in holes and making my roll bomb proof and stuff like that. Ed Blizzard. Ed is a pastor at a church in Pasadena and an avid paddler with a Baltimore Canoe and Kayak. He's on the board over there. He's always rounding up people uh, as a trip lead, you know, getting people on the water, making sure they have fun, uh, rounding up, have fantastic fellowship afterwards. You know, we get the chance to run some rapids and then break bread. Andrew Froome is a Howard County fireman and swift water rescue instructor uh, who I've taken most of the classes from. He's been a fantastic resource for how to handle all this safety stuff. Andrew is a great paddler. Um, he had a fairly fast progression. He's out there running all kinds of crazy stuff. There's always something to learn from him. Um, and I'm just really grateful to know him and, and be a part of that. Uh, lastly, Charlie Duffy, um, he's an old hand on the river. He's been paddling since probably the early 70s. Charlie grew up in the uh, Cockeysville Timonium area and was in Baltimore Coon and Kayak a long time ago. Now he lives in Northern Virginia. 
He's very active with uh, Fort Belvoir. He is on the safety committee for uh, the ACA, um, has helped write some of the guidelines there. He runs an amazing clinic on how to use ropes. I mean, in scouting, you learn how to tie all kinds of crazy knots and stuff, but you really learn to use ropes when you're rigging mechanical drag systems and munter hitches and all kinds of stuff like that on the river. And Charlie's been a real guru for that. Um, and also first aid, you know, we, we have a, we have first aid, but we also have sort of a special paddlers adapted first aid that deals with whatever might come up on the river. Um, you always have to be prepared. You know, it's, it's the boy scout thing. It's the river thing. So this concludes my presentation and now I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. That was so excellent, Phil, and so informative. Um, kayaking is a lifestyle. And we were supposed to see, is there one more photo you wanted to share, Sophia? Uh-oh. Well, we'll show it at some point. Um, and you probably know which one it is. But yes, I'll we'll pull it up in just a sec. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have some great comments and some questions. Is there a favorite river of yours in the area? Is there one that just speaks to you? Or That's you a know? very good question. Um, probably my current favorite for the diversity of the rapids and just the overall run would be the lower Yakagani, which is in Western Pennsylvania. Um, it's about a three hour drive from here, but it's a fantastic skill builder. You can take easy lines. You can take hard lines. Um, we do some training on it. We do a lot of trips. We do family trips on it. And I've actually taken my scout troop on that river three times. I try to get those guys to go once a year and you know, we start out with everybody in rafts, but I get more and more of them in duckies every year. Uh, I've had my son paddle down the lower Yakagani in a hard boat with TRR. Um, it's been fantastic. Hey, wow, there I am. I'm, I'm land paddling in front of the library. Well, this photo proves that you have mad skills and can just kayak anywhere. So um, thank you, Sophia, for putting that up. Appreciate it. Uh, do you kayak all 12 months of the year? Yes, absolutely. Um, I love getting out. It's part of my exercise, mental as well as physical. Um, you know, I, probably like a lot of people, I struggle with anxiety from time to time. And I find that, that any type of physical exercise is really good for recentering yourself. You know, in days I can't get out to the river, I go over to Riverside Park and I walk laps. For as much time or as long as I can stand, I walk fast. You know, I put some Grateful Dead in the earbuds and, I, man, I take off. But I prefer to go out on the river. Um, I love the river. It's beautiful. Um, I'm always working on skills. It, the river, I have a river family, you know, I run into people all the time. You know how you run into people in Baltimore at Smaltimore? The rivers are the same way. I can be out the lower yacht and run into somebody I know from the Potomac or a paddler I know from Harper's Ferry running the Shenandoah. Um, you remember Friday, we got all that rain. Yes. So we got a lot of rain. And so everybody's, you know, regular person like, oh man, it's raining a lot. You know, my basement's going to flood or I live in Ellicott City. This sucks. Oh, my river family is like, yeah, man, we're watching river gauges go up and say, you know, when this gets over a certain CFS level, cubic feet per second, it's runnable. So Saturday I went out and ran the Patapsco, um, the hollow field to Ellicott City run, you know, where we go right under the bridge into Ellicott City with some of my local Baltimore crew, which is a lot of fun. And then we double dipped. We ran that at dawn. And you know, it was a little, little crispy out. You know, everybody was wearing dry suits, which is, you know, what we start wearing this time of season. The, the progression for gear goes, you wear whatever you'd wear swimming in the really nice months. And some places are really warm. The water in the Potomac can get up to 90 degrees. It can feel really funky. Some stuff stays cooler because it's out further. Um, some stuff is dam released. Like a lot of the lower Yakagani is, is dam fed. So that tends to run on the cool side. Muddy Creek, which is right by the PA line in Delta PA as a feeder into the Susquehanna. And because that's a creek in a heavily wooded area, that stays pretty cool. You know, so sometimes you might wear a dry top or a wet suit, but I have a full dry suit that I wear for year round and we layer underneath it. You know, I have what we call the bunny suit. You know, it looks like a onesie that I wear underneath wool socks, um, extra neoprene. We have something called pogies, which uh, are neoprene, sockets that you put your hands in to fit around the paddle. They're surprisingly warm. 
So usually when it's really cold, you know, the only thing that's really uncovered is my face. I have ear flaps for the helmet. I wear a neoprene skull cap. It's pretty amazing. The coldest I've been out paddling um, in recent memory, I believe was it was New Year's Day 2018. And we decided paddlers love to paddle on New Year's Day. So we decided we were going to go run Little Falls in the Potomac, which, you know, it, Little Falls is just above the chain bridge, you know, out of sort of the north end of the sort of Georgetown area heading over into uh, what's that Arlington over there? Or, yeah. So it was really cold. It was in the teens. And I don't remember the exact temperature, but it was so cold that the splash froze his ice on our gear. And you, know, you can't undo buckles and zippers and stuff like that. So what happens is we had thermoses of warm water in the vehicles. So after you got out of the river and got back to your vehicle, you had to dump the warm water all over you so you could undo the gear to get it out or else you were going to be driving home with the defrost on full blast wearing your river gear. So, yeah, we go out all year. Um, I love it. And you know what's really cool about winter paddling? Only the hardcore crazy people are out. So you've got it all to yourself. Um, it's not crowded or zooed out. And, you know, it's yours for the cherry picking. Plus, it's just absolutely beautiful. When we get the first real snow, there's always a crew of us that like to get a snow paddle. You know, because the world is painted white. It's clean again. You know, just like you like going for a walk in the park in the snow or something or sledding on Federal Hill. We like to get out in the river and go check it out. So we did that in December uh, of 2020. It snowed and a buddy of mine, we went and hit the Patapsco. And it was just beautiful. 20 minutes away, jump right on it. So Good great question. people that you've inspired to this evening don't have to wait until the spring. They could. Well, a lot of beginners will wait till the spring. That's usually beginner season because, you know, again, gear can be a barrier to entry. We have some loaner gear, but the really warm stuff is so highly personal. But if someone gets into the sport, yeah, absolutely. They can paddle year round. Um, I've been paddling year round, well, pretty much since 2016. You know, once I'm back on the river, I'm, I'm on, I'm, you know, I'm one of those zombies going out there, loving it. Um, what's the wild, wildest wildlife you've seen while paddling? Well, we've seen a lot of bald eagles. I've seen bald e eagles on the Potomac, um, on the Patapsco, and also on the Shenandoah. And, you know, once upon a time, there weren't very many bald eagles. So there was a concerted effort to sort of help their population expand. And it's always super cool when you see them. Uh, we see a lot of turkey vultures. We see a lot of snakes. Um, all, and some snakes are, you know, you see some some cotton mouths every now and then or or uh, what's the one we really don't like to mess with? Copperhead. Yeah, there's places they like to hang out. There's a stone wall, which is the ruins of an old foundry in Harper's Ferry on the Shenandoah. There's a really cool rapid right there. And the snakes like to hang out next to the wall. So as we say in the river, the stick that moves is a snake. <laughs> So that's a lot of fun. Uh, my son loves to fish and can catch just about anything. He's actually caught uh, crayfish down by the Potomac. I don't know how he finds them. The, the kid has hawk-like eyes. He's caught in tadpoles. He once got two frogs that were mating on his paddle blade on Muddy Creek. I, he can find anything. It's just really wild. So he's he's our wildlife nut. But yeah, it's, it's very cool. That's great. Do you have any upcoming paddling or kayak events? And are there events year round? So the season is winding down for the outdoor stuff. We just finished one of the last adaptive paddles because it is getting colder. Um, only some of the hardcore guys like Fort Belvoir, Belvoir will be out all year because that's the whitewater chapter. And those guys, they're pretty hardcore. What usually happens for Walter Reed and some of the other chapters is they go indoor to use the pool. But unfortunately, COVID has been an impact on using pools. And Walter Reed has been very tight about letting us get access there because you know their, their protocol is super super strict which is understandable they have a very vulnerable population and so we really have to be extra extra careful last winter we were able to get some pool sessions that uh Kaliva set up with the madeira school which is over um towards mclean on northern virginia side we did have access to the pool at uh fort belvoir the ben yard pool um, but there was some change with that recently, something to do with the army staffing of lifeguards. You know, there's, there's bureaucracy. So, I mean, it's wonderful, but you know, it's, it's another one of our, our CrossFit exercise obstacles, things we have to move around. 
But there will be pool sessions. I believe Baltimore Canoe and Kayak is working on a pool session too. That's another great way for beginners to start. Start in a pool, you know, because you can see everything in the pool. The pool's warm. Everybody's there for the express purpose of helping you out. And pools are just fun. I love the pool in the winter. But I also go out on the river too. So the pool is a chance to drill on special skills like rolling that you might not want to practice in 35 degree water in January out on the Potomac. So I can go to the pool and, and roll 30, 40, 50 times, roll on both sides, you know, work on stern squirts and bracing and without getting cold. So that's a lot of fun. In the picture we showed where you were in front of the library with your kayak and some gear on your chest, was that your personal flotation device or is that where you carry things that you might need? Yeah, actually, that was my PFD. It's right behind me. I'll grab it. Okay. So this is a type five PFD. There are five types of PFDs. Um, you know, there's the traditional ring that you throw off, off by the dock, you know, in a marina. There's the orange horse collar one that you see a lot of people in John boats are using. Um, Type three is the active water sport one. You know, like if you're going to go jet skiing or something, you want to go river rafting. I forget what the type four one is, but it's it's some type of use. But this is a type five rescue PFD. You can see it doesn't really have a lot upper, so my shoulders can be free to paddle or do whatever I want. But this has great flotation. It does have a clamshell here. And the clamshell, I'm usually carrying a spare river knife, usually a granola bar or something. And my phone, I carry my phone in a dry box so I can take pictures and you know, also carry the phone in case you need to have a situation where you need to get in touch with somebody for contact. But there's some other safety gear. This is a river knife. This is used for cutting rope. Anybody that carries a rope needs to carry a knife because when it's time to get the rope out of the way, it's time to get out of the way. The rope can be a safety tool or it can be a hazard. And I've actually gotten hung up on fishing line before. And had to use this to get out. So I keep it here. So with one swipe of my right hand, I'm good to go. And a river whistle. We use whistle for communication on the river sometimes. We also use hand signals. The river uh, whistle is for like, you really got to pay attention then. One whistle is pay attention or round up. And three whistles means hurry. Something's going on. And the saying on the river is, if you hear two whistles, assume three. That's it. There's one and three. Nobody jokes around with the whistle. It's, it's for the real deal. But yeah, there are three basic pieces of safety gear, and the PFD is one of them. Uh, another piece that's really important is the old brain bucket, the helmet. Um, hey, see, Team River Runner sticker there. There's rocks on the bottom of the river. Um, I find a few from time to time. So you got to wear a helmet. In the dark ages of paddling, some people didn't wear helmets, which is crazy, but you've got to have a helmet, you know. This is, you know, sure, you can skateboard without a helmet if you want. You ride a bike without a helmet. Got to wear a helmet in the river. It's it's easy to, to get a tap in the head, and it's not fun. It's not fun at all. There's some other gear I carry. This is a 75-foot throw rope. Um, it's in a bag. We train to throw these. Throwing a rope is a perishable skill. Sometimes you're throwing this to for, you know, if you have to help a swimmer or something like that. Sometimes it's used for extracting gear you know boats get pinned every now and then uh we study how to use a mechanical drag system with this with a few pulleys a three to one system which is pretty amazing you know, it's part of swift water rescue training i always carry the rope always have a knife always have a whistle always have my phone another thing i always carry is a first aid kit now my first aid kit keeps getting bigger um i've taken wilderness first aid twice uh, all that's current cpr aed there's all kinds of good stuff in here could be a cut there's a CPR mask. There's vet wrap. Um, and then there's stuff that you really need all the time, like Tom's. You're on the river. You're hungover. You had spicy Mexican food before that. But you're in the middle of a seven-mile run. You can't get off. So, hey, man, who's got the first? You got any Tom's in there? You know, there's there's ibuprofen. There's acetaminophen. All kinds of good stuff. You have to have a first aid kit. Also, in this dry bag, I also like to throw a mandarin oranges, granola bars, beef jerky, just whatever, something to snack on the river because we're burning a lot of calories. You know, a day on the river, you can easily burn 1,000, 2,000 calories, no problem. Even if you're using the current to drift, there's times where you're working and there's times where you're playing. Like I said, it's a great workout. So 
it's very important to carry stuff and to hydrate. I always carry a water bottle. I've seen people get dehydrated on the river and that that's just a terrible, terrible thing. So we're always hydrating very heavy. Super, super important. Someone wants to know how many phones have you lost on the river? None. I've never lost a phone. Wow. That's an accomplishment. Yeah, you can lose a phone. Um, you got to be careful about when you get it out. Um, the dry box is key. Uh, I, I always carry a phone. We need it for contact. You know, you just have to, like I said, it's part of essential safety gear. I would like to get at some point a GoPro. Lots of my friends have GoPros and they take crazy video. I wish I had some video to share with you guys. There's tons of video out there. It really brings the immediacy of it to you when you're watching the video. I, adventure sports, they're a blast. And having the videos is, is part of the fun. I have to say one thing about video and pictures. They make everything look smaller and flatter than it really is. You know, so you see some of this stuff on somebody's YouTube channel and then you go out and put your butt in it and you go, wow, man, that's bigger than I thought it was. So when you're looking at that stuff, remember when you're, you're down lower, when you're in, in the mix and um, it's just, it's incredible, but yeah, it's wonderful stuff. And no, I've never lost a phone. I don't plan on it. Knock on wood. Yes. Uh, someone commented when I've gone kayaking, I enjoy the peacefulness of the water. You seem to want the more exciting wild adventures. Um, yeah, white water is a little bit of an adrenaline rush. Um, you could say that. Uh, there's still a piece to it. Not all of it's running all the time. And I like getting out flat water sometimes. And like I say, in the winter, we do a tanning, which is paddling upstream. Uh, we do that anglers usually up through Mather Gorge, below Great Falls. It's beautiful. It's very peaceful. Just being out in the water in general is peaceful. It's quiet. There's no traffic noise. Um, there's nobody arguing or blaring a radio. You know, you have the sound of flowing water, which is, to me, is the sound at home. It's very peaceful, white noise. I just feel so at home out there. It is peaceful. Um, even when I'm in the rapids, to me, it's peaceful. I find myself centered and focused. But, you know, the thing with TRR is it's inclusive. There's folks that go flatwater paddling. There's a chapter based out of Andrews uh, Air Force Base, the Southern Maryland chapter. And they take off a lot from Fort Smallwood, which is down in Marsbury, Maryland, which is really near. Um, there's a ship graveyard there from World War One. I'm trying to remember the name of it. But there's a lot of wildlife there. You know, they put all these wooden ships that they were building for World War One. They, they had to basically dump them because the war ended before they were going to put them. Mallows Bay, that's the name of it. Gorgeous. So these things, they all rot down to the waterline. But there's all kinds of wonderful sea life there and, you know, ducks and snakes and fish and, you know, plant life. It's just such a rich thing, kind of sort of like man-made reef. That's a very peaceful scenic paddle. Great fishing down there, too. Kayak fishing is also something that's really popular. I have some friends out of Annapolis that they go, they go catch rockfish like keepers, you know, like rockfish. How do they catch them? It's not like you're going to have a rod or reel. Yeah, they do. They have a rod and reel. Oh, wow. Yeah. They're on what's called a sit on top kayak. Not everybody sits inside like these things. You know, we sit in these and we're actually strapped in. You know, like I said, this, this is a spray skirt. It's a neoprene deck with a tunnel. And I wear that and I put myself in the boat. So I'm really in the boat. Those guys that are uh, kayak fishing or sit on tops, or they're not doing that. Um, access for them is different, you know. And, it, yeah, it's peaceful. Stand-up paddleboarding is another thing that's very peaceful. Um, and there's actually yoga classes, stand-up paddleboarding yoga classes. Stand-up paddleboarding is an amazing core workout. But to add yoga on top of that, and, you know, the water's peaceful. And it's just, it's incredible. It's really cool stuff. I think they just started offering paddle boarding uh, in the Inner Harbor. Was it this past summer? It seems pretty recent. Yeah. And there's also a group. Um, I believe there's a kayak group based out of Canton that will paddle in the Inner Harbor. And they'll come across to Tide Point, you know, where Under Armour is. And there's some storage down there. Again, it's a club you can join. And that's, that's more like sea kayaking, longer boats, um, boats with keels fantastic exercise and it's also wonderful to see you know baltimore from the water as well it's great exercise fresh air you just feel connected and, and a, a new perspective of the city also uh, very much so. very much so someone commented uh what a wonderful organization team runner river runner 
is doing such amazing work with veterans. Thank you for bringing it to people's attention. Well, thank you. We, we're just so thank you. Yeah. We're loving um, life. I'm sorry. Go ahead. We're loving life. And you're making a difference. I think that's what's so important in people's lives. That that's um, admirable. Thank you. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have this evening. Phil Jacoby, you are a man of many talents. Thank you for sharing one of your passions with us tonight. Uh, it was just outstanding. And I'm positive that you inspired members of the audience to learn more about kayaking opportunities in the area and Team River Runner. So thank you for sharing all of your fascinating stories. Thank you, audience, for joining us. We appreciate you. Everyone, enjoy the rest of your evening. Stay safe, stay well. And hey, maybe we'll see you on the river. See you on the river. <laughs>